Amen. Acts chapter 24, we're going to get through this whole chapter. So Paul has been taken to um, Caesarea by the, um, by the chief captain of the Romans here, um, kind of uh, rescued from this, this conspiracy that was put in place um, to kill him. And of course, um, Ananias, the high priest, he comes after Paul. Um, he chases after Paul and he goes to um, the governor and tries to appeal to him. Um, look at verse number one. Um, the Bible says, And after five days, Ananias the high priest descended with the elders with a certain order named Tertullus, Tertullus who informed the governor against Paul. So Ananias, um, really interesting part of the story here. But anyway, Ananias comes, and he basically comes with his lawyer <laughs> to speak for him. Um, has this man, this orator, um, who's you know, a great speaker to make this case against Paul. All right, And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that, that, that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by, by thy providence, we accept it always and in places most noble Felix with all thankfulness. So, you know, he kind of starts off his little, uh, you know, accusation against Paul here with a lot of flattery, basically saying, like, you know, it's, it's uh, I mean, so much for a religious leader, he's basically saying that, you know, the, this you being in charge of us is by providence, it's by God, and he's just really like laying it on um, the flattery here. Most noble Fe Felix, we're very thankful for you. And then, of course, verse number four, notwithstanding, here comes the bad part, right? So whenever somebody's, whenever somebody's flattering you, they're trying to manipulate you, right? They're going to manipulate you. So here comes the manipulation in verse four. Notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldst hearest of, the clemen of thy clemency a few words. So here comes the manipulation. Look at verse number five. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, who also have gone about to profane the temple whom we took and would have judged according to our law. But the chief captain, Lysias, came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come unto thee by examining of whom thyself mayest take it knowledge of all these things, wherefore we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, meaning they agreed, saying that these things were so. So the first thing you need to understand is, did he tell the full truth here? Did he really tell what really happened? He basically said that Paul came and tried to you know, profane the temple. He's seditious, meaning he's trying to overthrow governments. He's, you know, you know, this pestilent person, you know, is moving sedition, all this. Just basically saying that Paul's a very wicked person trying to overthrow governments and profane their religion. And then he even throws Lysias under the bus. He throws the chief captain under the bus that, you know, this chief captain came and did this great violent thing and took this man away from us. So, they basically just made themselves liars. I mean, it wasn't really that smart of a thing for them to do because clearly Felix is going to talk to the chief captain, who's the Roman. He's basically going to ask him what happens. And here we see, like, we're about to see um, a really brilliant move by Paul. And I didn't really get into this um, in too much detail in Acts chapter 23, but you're going to see why Paul did what he did at the beginning of Acts chapter 23, and you're going to really start to see, I mean, if you haven't seen already, um, the intelligence of Paul, but this is a really good example of just how sharp and smart Paul is. All right, look at verse number 10. So we basically make themselves liars. You know, not only is, look, not only is Felix going to talk to the chief captain, who's a Roman, but the chief captain is going to have much more weight to Felix than this, this guy. Like these, you know, the, the Romans don't respect the Jews. You know, they don't care uh, about the Jews and their religion. And look, Paul knows this. All right, look at verse number 10. Then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. He's like, I was only in Jerusalem 12 days. And look at all this problems, right? I, there's all this trouble. And they neither found me in the temple, 
disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city. So he's basically saying all this addition and all that is just lies. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. So that's a, that's a nice little statement right there. So Paul is basically saying, you know, he's refuting the heresy. Because he's saying, I mean, he's really saying they're the heretics. Because Paul is saying, I believe the Bible. I believe the whole Bible. And if you read the Bible and you understand what the New Testament is saying, the Jews of Jesus' day didn't believe Jesus because they didn't believe Moses and the prophets. It's not like, you know, there's this fantasy out there today or this fallacy amongst Christians. They believe, oh, well, the Jews are, they're just like Christians, except they only believe the Old Testament and not the New Testament. Look, I used to think this myself because I just didn't know. I just didn't know. But the bottom line is Jesus himself said, no, if you would have believed Moses and the prophets, you would have believed me. So Paul is basically saying, no, I am practicing my religion purely. He's like, I am following the law and the prophets. And, you know, he doesn't say at this moment that all those prophets just point to Christ. He doesn't go there right now because he's going to, you know, he's going to show you something else here in just a second. But basically he's, he's just saying, like, he's saying truthfully, there's no heresy here. He's like, there's no heresy. I just, I am practicing my religion purely by following the law and the prophets. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that's what you're doing. You believe the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And that means that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have, look what he says, and we have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Now this is brilliant right here. So who is here trying to accuse Paul? It is Ananias. It is the same high priest. So there's three Ananiases in the book of Acts, all right? There's Ananias and Sapphira at the beginning. They were, they were saved people, but they were killed for, you know, that, we remember that story. There was Ananias that Paul met right after um, he was blinded on the road to um, Damascus. And then there's this Ananias, which is the high priest, okay? Now go back to Actually, don't go back there yet. Let's read a couple more verses, and then I'll get to this. But what does he bring up? He brings up the resurrection of the dead again. He doesn't go into preaching the gospel. He just brings up the resurrection of the dead. Why? And he says, And herein do I exercise myself to, always, to have always a conscience void to, offense, void to offense toward God and toward men. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and, my, and offerings, whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with the multitude nor with tumult who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had ought against me. He's like, there was a lot of Jews that didn't have any problem with me in the temple. This is talking about when he, was, he went through that Nazarite vow um, with those guys and he was purified with them. He says, or else let these same here say, because that's why he did that, right? To show that he's not against the Jewish traditions. That he's just, that he's, he's being a Jew to the Jews and a Gentile to the Gentiles. Right? This is what he was doing. Or else let the same here say if they found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council. Look at, look at verse number 21 now. Except it be for this one voice. He's talking about Ananias. That cried standing among them, touching the what? The resurrection of the dead I am called in question by you this day. Turn back to Acts chapter 23 and look at verse number 9 and 10. Remember what Paul brought up? What was it? It was the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Acts chapter 23. And they were both the Jews. They were all unbelieving Jews. None of them believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were all after Paul. And what did Paul do? Paul was a Pharisee, remember. Paul was a Pharisee, and there was the Sadducees there. And the Sadducees did not believe in what? They did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. So Paul brings up this one thing. So he's got all this mob against him, and he knows that they differ on this one thing. So what does he do? He brings up that one thing and he causes this big riot, basically. He causes this riot where the Jews are fighting amongst themselves. And the Pharisees in Acts chapter 23 are actually like, just let him go. <laughs> they're just like, let him go. Because they believe in the resurrection of the dead. So they're like, he agrees with us, so they kind of liked him. 
at that point because they were more upset with the Sadducees at that point over this argument of the resurrection of the dead than they were with Paul. Look at verse number 9 of Acts chapter 23. It says, And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Look at verse number 10. And when there grows a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them. It shows you the violence of this riot. Caused by what? This question of the resurrection of the dead. So what I'm trying to get you to understand is Ananias is a Sadducee. He's a Sadducee and he doesn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So what Paul is doing is he is bringing up to Felix, the governor of this territory, he's saying, this is all over some stupid argument between the Jews and their religion. This is what caused all the trouble. Look, and Paul does believe in the resurrection of the dead. He believes in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's not preaching the whole gospel right now, but he's telling the truth when he says, this is all about the resurrection of the dead. And look at this. Felix knew this. Felix had heard about this riot. He, must, he probably already talked to the chief captain, is my guess. right? But when Felix heard these things, having a more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, when Lysias, the captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. And the, the captain has already told him about the riot over this, this argument between the resurrection of the dead, between the Jews. But this is the point. Paul brings up, he's like, you know what? This guy's just got an argument with me over this. He doesn't like me because of this dissension amongst the Jews and their own religion, is basically what he's saying. All right? So look, and this guy, Felix, you know, knew that Ananias wasn't telling him the whole truth. Or if he didn't know all of it now, he was going to know all of it later. He commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, that he should, so I mean, he basically took Paul aside to a degree here. He's just like, yeah, you know, I don't, I'm not convinced that this guy is what you said that he is. After certain days, when Felix came down with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now Paul preaches the gospel to Felix, right? But I mean, Paul is just being straight up honest what happened to, you know, in, in Jerusalem and saying, look, this was all an argument between the Jews. This was all an argument between the Jews. And Paul says, there was plenty of Jews that had no problem with me. The Pharisees and the Jews that he was purified with, that the Jews that were saved. The Jews that had actually gotten saved. So he preaches the gospel. He gets a chance to preach the gospel to Felix, which is pretty cool. And he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. And as he reasoned, of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time, and when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Now, this is interesting because there's no indication in this chapter, you know, Felix is pretty much out of being governor after this chapter. Um, there's no indication that Felix gets saved. But it is interesting, and you will see this um, if you become a soul winner and you soul win enough, you will see this. You will see, I just saw it just two or three weeks ago, where I preached the gospel to um, this person that did not get saved. They did not get saved, but while I was preaching the gospel to them, they were emotionally affected by what was happening. They were emotionally affected. They were, you know, tearing up and things like this, and it was definitely affecting them, you know, and look, that's what's happening to Felix here. What's, what's happening to Felix is he's having the gospel preached to him, and, you know, he's, Paul is reasoning with him. And look, you can reason with people with, about the gospel because it's the only thing that really makes any logical sense that's out there, all right, the true gospel. But Felix trembled. You know, he didn't get saved, but he trembled. He, he understood the depth of what Paul was saying, all right? And look, he was thinking. He was thinking about it. And he says, look, I'll, I'll talk to you later basically, is what he says to Paul, okay? But look, he's like, I'll call for you later. Now look what he does in verse number 26. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might lose him. Wherefore, he sent for him the oftener and communed 
with him. So he's kind of like, you know, I mean, he didn't get saved, and he's not like a great person, <laughs> right? I mean, he's hoping, he's kind of, he's kind of, you know, just kind of holding Paul ransom, basically. He's kind of holding Paul ransom, and, you know, Paul's, Paul's, uh, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't dislike Paul. Why? Because he sent for him the, he sent for him the oftener. You know what that means? It's a, that's, that's archaic language for, he sent for him often. He sent for him often to speak with him and to commune with him. So Paul was somebody that Felix enjoyed spending time with. He enjoyed having a meal with this person. He enjoyed speaking with Paul, reasoning with Paul, all these different things. And then look at verse 27. It says, after two years, look, he did this for two years. Portius Festus came into Felix's room. That means um, he came in to take over the governorship into this position. And Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. All right, so that's really what I want to apply tonight is this idea that while this guy didn't get saved, he enjoyed being around Paul. He enjoyed communing with Paul, and he just sent for him over and over and over again. Look, Felix wasn't even, Felix wasn't even a, a great person, that, that, you know, as we could see of him here. He's basically holding Paul ransom just so he can you know, speak with him and maybe get some money out of Paul. All right? But look at this. Let me just ask you this. Do people ask you about your faith? You know, do people send for you the oftener? I guess is a good way of, of saying it, relating it to this story. Look, what you have to understand is, is Felix really enjoyed the intellect and what Paul had to say. I mean, Paul is clearly a brilliant person. And look, I enjoy talking to brilliant people, even brilliant people that aren't saved, I enjoy talking to. And that was the situation with Felix. Felix really didn't seem to care too much about accepting Jesus Christ, but he just wanted to be around Paul and he enjoyed talking to him. So look, the Bible today is a great mystery to people. One thing you have to understand is, and maybe you can still remember back before you read the Bible, you know, if you've, you know, if you've read the Bible through cover to cover a couple of times, you know, I'm not saying you know the Bible perfectly, but you definitely know what the Bible is saying. You definitely know, you know, what is in the Bible. I can remember, you know, being a teenager, even being in my 20s, just being like, what is actually in the Bible? It was just such this great mystery to me. Just what is in the pages of this book? Thinking, I wonder, I wonder if I'll ever know what's really this book is about. I remember thinking um, that way. Look, that's how a lot of people think today. Because they don't know what's in the Bible. I mean, I've showed you trends and all these stats where, like, there's just never been a time in the history of our country where, where people know the least about the Bible than there is right today. And tomorrow will be worse. You know, we're hitting all-time lows every single day. So, look, the, the mystery, the Bible's a mystery to the common man. What does it say? Who is God? You know, I mean, the question is, you know this. You know. You know. So do people send for you the oftener? Do people want to? No. This man liked Paul. He wasn't doing what was right by Paul, but he liked Paul. Felix wasn't a believer, and there's no evidence he ever became one. So tonight I want to talk about you know, this idea of being in the world. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This idea of being in the world, you're like, Pastor, what are you talking about? You're telling us to, to separate from the world. Yes. Yes. Both are true. And I'm going to hopefully explain it to you tonight to where you understand, you know, what I'm talking about. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and look at verse number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, or yes, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 9. Now, the verse that we go to many times is 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 11, because that's the verse that talks about, you know, church discipline, things that are not allowed in the church. You know, that is one of the things, by the way, that really separates us. Aside from having the gospel correct, that is 1 Corinthians 5.11 is one of the things that really separates us from the vast majority of churches today. Even churches that have the right gospel, 
most times will not execute on 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 11, meaning the things that are literally not to be allowed in the church. And I've preached on that till I am blue in the face, so that's not um, the point. But look, what's interesting is the verses before that. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says this. It says, I wrote unto you in an epistle, in a letter, not to company with fornicators. So the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is this, this person that's in the church that's in fornication. And Paul is telling them at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 5, you know, you got to get this person out of the church. you got to get them out of the church and let Satan deal with them. you know, you got to get them out of the church and let Satan deal with them until they get right. And then, you know, 2 Corinthians is kind of like, hey, he got right. Now, you know, forgive and have mercy and all this stuff. But he's, Paul's saying you can't have that kind of stuff in the church. All right. And then he goes into this, um, this doctrine. But look at verse number 10. He says, you're not to company with fornicators. So he went through this, this person that was in fornication. Then look at verse number 10. He says, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world. You're like, what? He's saying, you can't have fornicators in the church. He's like, you're not to company with fornicators. And in verse number 11, it, it uses this, this term, one that is called a brother, meaning somebody that is in the church that is saved. Okay? But then in verse number 10, it says, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolatries. He goes through the whole list. For then, must ye needs go out of the world. You see what he's saying here is, yes, these things, in verse number 11, these six things in verse number 11 that I list out, that's not to be in the church. He's like, but it's not like you can't be around those people in the world. He's like, otherwise you'd have to not be in the world. Otherwise you'd have to like lock yourself in your house and not go anywhere. He's saying... I'm talking about these things in the church, in the context of brothers and sisters in Christ in the church. He's like, but you would have to go out of the world and not participate in life if you were going to apply that to everybody. So there's a difference between what's allowed in the world, in the church, and what you, know, you can be around in the world. Paul is clearly saying that here. Look, here's what he's saying. We will be in the world. We will be in the world. Paul had no choice but to be around Felix. He had no choice. You know, I mean, that's kind of like, it's kind of like a, a, a work situation. You know, I mean, obviously Paul was in prison, but I mean, you have to go to work every day. You know, I mean, they're not going to put you in prison if you don't go to work every day. But I mean, the point is, Paul had no choice to be around Felix. We are going to be in the world. But Felix liked him, though. He called for him. Look, we have many similar situations is what I'm trying to get you to understand tonight. Look, employment is a, is a good situation, is a good example. Employment, um, your neighbors, who you live next to physically, you know, in, in this world. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. So look, the, just to start off this evening, I'm trying to get you to understand that that. Paul is telling us in 1 Corinthians 5, verse number 10, and verse number 11, he's like, certain things, he's like, this is how the church needs to be managed. But then he's saying, but you can't apply this to the world or you'll have to just like become a hermit and live in a cave. He's like, that's not the case. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 7. So this is, you know, um, uh, qualifications for a pastor here. But if you look at qualifications for a pastor, you know, that's just saying these are all you know, these are all characteristics that every Christian should have. Every Christian man, especially, should have, since it's talking about a man, a pastor. Every Christian should have these characteristics. The only difference is that if the pastor doesn't have these characteristics, it literally disqualifies him from, you know, being a pastor. All right? So look at verse number 7. It says, moreover, just adding more characteristics or qualifications for a pastor, he must have a good report of them that, which are without. You see that? It said he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. It's saying, basically what this is saying is that normal people should like you. That's what this is saying. People that are without, people in the world. All right, now, with work, I've been asked this question, I don't know why, but over the, I'm, I'm glad this came up in Acts chapter 24, because I've been asked this question like through email like four or five times over the last six weeks or so. Just like, how do you handle, you know, being a Christian and being at work? 
being amongst, you know, unsaved people. And let me just say this. There's no magic answer for every situation. I'm going to give you some concepts. I'm going to give you some biblical concepts tonight. All right, and look, it, it, this is a good one to, if you're having a situation, this is a good one to actually ask counsel on. Because if I have more detail on what is actually going on in a specific situation, I can give more, you know, specific you know, advice that would be, that would be, be more beneficial. But I'm just going to give you some concept tonight. There's no magic bullet um, for every work situation, all right? There's all kinds of different work situations. Turn to Jude, okay? So we're going to talk about how to be in the world, how to be in the world. We're not, well, I'm not talking about being of the world, okay? I'm not talking about, you know, this is a prerequisite to this conversation we're going to have tonight, to the sermon tonight, is I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about entering into sin with people, I'm not talking about, you know, going to the bar after work so people like you. This is not what I'm talking about. All right? I'm not talking about, you know, look, I socialize with my Christian brothers and sisters. That's who I socialize with. All right? But I'm talking about, you know, just some ideas on how to get along with your neighbors, how to get along with people at work. Look, you should have a good report of those that are without. All right? Look at Jude. Go to Jude and look at verse... Jude, right before Revelation, the book of Jude, look at verse number 22, and there's some concepts, all right? So there's some concepts that we need to understand here. And you have to understand that there's a difference between a work situation and a door-to-door a -door soul winning situation, all right? So there's some concepts that you need to understand here. First of all, we know that we're talking about just, you know, getting along with people, being in the world, having a good report of them that are without, we're not talking about becoming of the world, loving the world, becoming a friend of the world, entering into sin with the world. That's not what I'm talking about. All right, look at Jude chapter 22. And uh, Jude chapter 1, uh, there is only one chapter, but verse 22 and 23. The Bible says this, it says, Keep yourself in the love of God, verse 21, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and then we see a contrast in, in uh, verse 22 and 23. It says, And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. So here's what you have to understand. Here's what you have to understand. Dealing with people without is a balance of these two verses. It's a balance of these two verses. Look, I'm not talking about um, you know, I'm talking about, and I'm talking about normal people, which the va look, thankfully, the vast majority of people that you should be working with, that should be your neighbors, that people that are without that you should know, uh, are, are normal people. And, you know, I'm not talking about a, a workplace that's just like this extra vulgar uh, workplace. I remember when, when Garrett first started working, one of the questions that I just, I started asking him right away at the dinner table was, what do they speak like at this job? What are the conversations at this job? Because I didn't want him working. Look, I've been on construction sites. I have been in situations where there's just groups of just extra vulgar people. And that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is just normal, everyday people without. All right? But look, what you have to understand is as a Christian, and especially as a Christian, that would like other people to be saved, it is a balance of these two verses. Meaning, um, I mean, there's basically three kinds of people, okay? There's three kinds of people. There's there are three kinds of people. First of all, there's people that you get saved with fear, all right? This is more of the door-to-door -door soul winning. This is more of the confrontational soul winning. This is the kind of soul winning where you go up to somebody and you're going to tell them that they're a sinner and you're going to tell them that because of their sin, they deserve to go to hell. That's saving someone with fear. Okay, that's showing people the danger that they're in. All right, but verse number 22, so that's the first type of person, you know, is this person that you're going to save with fear. And that's just straight in your face, the gospel right there. And that's what we do going around soul winning. It's confrontational soul winning. If people want to hear, you know, look, we, we, we're not rude or mean, don't get me wrong, but if people want to hear, we're going to tell them the, the truth straight from the Bible, straight to their face. And that's how it's going to go. And that's saving someone with fear. And as Felix, look, as Felix heard the gospel, you know, he was, he was trembling. Because, look, he was, he was understanding that fear. But the second kind of person 
is a person that needs, you know, compassion. That needs compassion. Maybe this is a person that, you know, you're not in a position where you can give the whole gospel. Or, or you're not in a, a position where you feel like um, they can handle, you know, that type of truth or whatever. But this is a balance. And look, here's the thing you need to understand. It takes wisdom to understand which of these two approaches to take. Even at the door, even at the door it takes great wisdom and experience to figure out how many people, like say there's somebody that I know disagrees and is not going to get saved at the door. Yet there will be times when I feel like I can at least tell them, you know, look, the difference between what you believe and what I am telling you from the Bible, the difference is heaven and hell. Where I can go and I can boldly say to that person, okay, I understand that you don't believe this, but please understand me, the Bible does not, because a lot of people think these are small differences. A lot of people think, oh, well, I just think that I have to be good too and, and all that. And it's a, Look, you can understand, it takes wisdom to understand when you can push. And, and just leave, but that's leaving a seed of, of fear with somebody. And look, you do it because you love them, right? You do it because you love them. But look, then there's the third type of person, which is this. So there's people that you save with fear. There's people that, you know, need more compassion. But then there's a the third kind of type of person that's just not interested at all. They're just not interested at all. Okay, so look. You say, how will I get people, let's, let's just hang that one on the, on the coat rack for just a second. And let me just give you some ideas on how you can have, you know, how as a Christian can, are people going to like me? That's the question. How as a Christian are my neighbors going to like me? How as a Christian are my coworkers going to like me? Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. How should a Christian act when they are without? How should a Christian, um, how should he look? How should she look when, you know, she or he are without? Look at verse number um, 5 of Ephesians chapter 6. Verse number 5 of Ephesians chapter 6. I'm just going to give you just a few things that should be a characteristic of the Christian. Because look, if you, if you capture these few things that I'm going to go through, being a Christian in a workplace especially, people will know you're a Christian in the first day. People will know that something is different about you on the first day of work if you do it in the right way. And look, that doesn't mean they won't like you. Right? It just means they will know something is different about you. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 5. The Bible says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. This is how you work for a bad boss right here. This is how you work for a boss who you don't agree with the things that he says or you don't agree with how he runs things or whatever. Look, the Christian should be obedient at work. And this is a big deal today because everybody mouths off. Everybody's like, I know more than the boss. I should be the boss. You know, the boss doesn't know what he's doing. I know better. Look, you don't know better or you would be the boss first of all. But the Christian should be obedient. And you say, how can I be obedient? Because I don't really have any respect for this guy or whatever. Because you should be working for him like you're working for Christ. It's really, it's easy to do. It's a mindset. It's really a mindset. You just work for that job, for that company, for that boss, like you're working for Jesus Christ. It's, it's easy. It's easy to do it. And then you're just obedient. You know, look, I mean, just do what you're told. I mean, I'm not talking about doing bad things or illegal things or sinful things, but when it comes to go left or go right, and he wants to go right and you want to go left, he's the boss. You go right. That's it. You just work for the boss. You work for the master like you're working for Jesus Christ. And look, you can actually affect if, because like work situations like where you have this guy that's constantly always mouthing off and always being disobedient and always trying to cause you know, insurrections at work or whatever, you can actually be a force for good in situations like that just by not partaking in those things. That, those, those, that, those are like cancers, and they hurt everybody. They hurt everybody. Because some people, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter left or right. They just want to just do the opposite of what any kind of leader wants to do. They're just going to, they'll go to the next job and the next job and the next job and they'll be the same person. They'll just disagree with every single, it's, it's a disease that they have and they go around, they spread it to everyone in workplaces. But the Christian should have nothing to do with that stuff. The Christian should just be obedient and, you know, you can affect the, occult, the culture. 
in, in the work group or the work environment or the company or whatever. Be obedient. That's the first thing. The second thing is this, and here's what will really make you stand out. Be appropriate. Be appropriate at work. Watch what you say. Look, it's not going to take too long for a Christian to stand out to people because they're not speaking like people, like normal people speak today. The way people speak today is not Christian. You say, well, what if I get in a conversation and, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's a, I'm talking to a bunch of people and all of a sudden inappropriate conversations come up. Leave the situation. I, I, I love situations like that because it's an opportunity for me to show who I am. Look, politely though. Politely. I mean, I'm not, you know, first of all, stay professional at work. Stay professional at work. I don't go and like, you know, and, and spend like hours just like just talking to people casually about everything in their life. Because number one, you should be working. And number two, you know, if you get in a situation, you know, where there's three people and somebody's like, oh yeah, you know, went out and they start talking about how they're all drinking and doing stuff that, you know, I, you, know you shouldn't be part of. You know, I'll just uh, politely, many times I won't even say anything. I'll just kind of leave the conversation. And look, people will notice that though. Here's what I don't do. Oh, you shouldn't be drinking. You're drinking? That's, it's wicked. Wicked. <laughs> you know, people talk about, oh, you know, my girlfriend, this and that, or whatever. Wicked. But no, I'm serious. People do this, though. And guess what? Everyone hates them. Now, look, I don't approve of fornication. I don't approve of drinking. I'm not going to be part of any of those things. Just politely walk away. And then people like, people like don't do stuff like that around me. They probably just think, you know, they're going to think you're boring, probably. Yes. That's how I think about that. But just be, look, in general, just, in general, just stay professional and just do your work. I mean, that's, that's how the Christian should be at work. You know, I've always been like, I've always been a fan of like, and look, there's women in the workplace. I mean, my wife's not going to be in the workplace. My daughter's not going to be in the workplace. But there's women in the workplace. I've always actually kind of been a fan of, like, all the anti-harassment stuff. Because I don't feel like, you know, I always think, like, if my daughter was at work, I, want her, I wouldn't want her listening to a bunch of vulgarity and a bunch of, like, sick people talking about sick stuff. Look, I've seen women be vulgar, and, and women have to listen to vulgar people. I've seen both sides of it. But the point is, is just, I'm all about having an appropriate workplace but be appropriate just be appropriate and if you find yeah it's uncomfortable just walk away who cares who cares just walk away those are great examples for you great times to to show a testimony of kind of who you are you know by just you know not being part of situations like that right and look and here's another thing like if i if i see like someone being inappropriate to someone else like here's another thing i'm saying something about it I'm not just going to let stuff go. Like, if I see something like, you know, if you see something inappropriate, you shouldn't let that go. I mean, you, you can be a nice way, you know, you don't have to dress somebody down in front of 50 people, but you can nicely talk to people, too. Be like, hey, you know, I mean, it's, you get your point across better if you just say things a little bit different. You know, I mean, you can, you can say things like that, but it's all about how you talk to people. And it's all about how you, you know, approach people. So be, look, be obedient, be appropriate. Here's another one. Be honest. Just be an honest person. Look, people are going to figure out if you do what you say you, you, you're going to do. If you're somebody that just, just says stuff and never does it, people are going to figure that out real fast. But if you're the type of person that's like, hey, I'll do that, and then it gets done, and you follow through on things, you're going to get a name for yourself. Be trustworthy. Be friendly. Turn to Psalm chapter 75. Here's one. Here's one. Be content. Be content. The Christian should be content. At work, all right. First Timothy chapter six and verse six. You're going to Psalm chapter seventy-five, but First Timothy chapter six and verse number six is but God. It says godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, this contentment at, at work, especially, is is just a problem that I've seen for twenty years. People, they're just they're just upset because they're upset because they don't they don't get enough. They don't they're not appreciated enough. Uh, here's a really stupid one. You know, Joe makes more than me. First of all, like, there's never anything good that comes from two people knowing what they make <laughs> at work. 
if Joe and, and Bob both decide to tell each other like what they make, there's always going to be trouble there. Because Joe's going to be like, oh, I make, you know, $20 an hour. And Bob's going to be like, I make 15. And Bob thinks Joe's a loser secretly. And he's like, that loser makes $20 an hour? And then, you know, Joe's like, yeah, you know, you make, he makes 15 because he's a loser. You know what I mean? It's just it, nothing good comes of it. Nothing good comes of it. Because it just, first of all, like what somebody else makes should have, like literally you should not care about that at all. Like you should care nothing about that. Because what does that even affect you? That doesn't affect you the, the, the least bit, what somebody else makes. What affects you is what you make. So just be content with what you make. But, you know, here's the thing. Here's the thing. If I operate as a Christian in the workplace, you know, there's people that you're going to see that are going to get ahead by nefarious means. Because some of that stuff works. You know, some of the, the lying and taking credit for things and maybe doing things, you know, in a not quite ethical way. You know, look, that gets people ahead. That's why they do it. That's why they do it. But look, just understand that being a Christian and doing things the proper way and doing things right and being appropriate and being obedient and being content, maybe that's not going to get you to be the CEO of the company. Who cares? Be content where you are. And look, look at Psalm chapter 75. Psalm chapter 75, look at verse number 6. This is all you have to remember right here. Like, oh, my boss, he doesn't, there's this guy and he's constantly just like singing his own praises and he gets all the promotions and he gets all the raises and I get nothing. Hey, just be the content, appropriate, honest, trustworthy Christian. That's what you need to be. Why? Because God promotes. God promotes. Look at verse number 6. It says, Promotion neither cometh from the east, nor the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth down one, and he setteth up another. Look, God will promote you. When you're doing the right thing, and you're, you're, you're being a, you know, so go and be a good witness for Jesus Christ. Go be, go be a good example of a Christian in the workplace, and look, God will promote you. God will, God will promote you. You know, go be, go be that person that just becomes uh, just super skillful in, in their trade. Go be that top 10%. That's what every, every Christian should strive for. Just be that top 10%. And then have a, you know, you know what you'll have? You'll have a good testimony. You'll have a good testimony. People will, you know, they're like, oh, that guy, you know, that guy, he doesn't, he doesn't swear, and he doesn't drink, and, and he doesn't seem to do anything that's fun. But, man, is he good at what he does. Man, when I need help and I go to him, boy, does he get stuff done. Man, well, he will help me. He will, you know, you want to you get, people, get people's trust, you help people out of, out of a jam. Somebody that's in trouble and you go and you, you know, in their job and you go and you help them and expect nothing in return, that person will be, will be stitched, their heart will be stitched to yours for, for the whole time that you work there. But look, some Christians struggle with what I'm talking about tonight. I mean, they're, they're zealous, which is good. They're zealous, which is good, but they struggle with interacting in the world. They struggle with it. And look, to support a family, guys, you need to be able to interact in the world. Not become of the world, but you need to be able to interact in the world. They, they, have, they have problems in two places. I'm going to explain that to you tonight. The first thing that they do is they find any reason. They find any reason to spiritualize not being able to work somewhere. And look, this is, this is one of those decisions where if, if you think, and look, it, these, these are usually, uh, it's usually a trend in, in, in these people, but they'll find some spiritual reason to not be able to work at every single place they go to work at. And look, I, I don't want somebody that's just working amongst a bunch of wicked reprobates and vulgar people and perverted people and all this kind of stuff. And look, it's out there. It's out there, but most people are not like that. All right? So that's the first type of person. They just find a reason to just spiritualize just not being able to work anywhere. Everyone at the job is not saved, and they can't work there. 
because of some reason that they find, right? They didn't get all saved when I gave them the gospel on the first day and I walked around for hours, you know, soul winning at work on the first day and they all do wicked things and I can't work there. You know, so that, that's, the, that's the first one. That's a pretty extreme case. But here, here's a more common case. It's just Christians that just struggle getting along with unbelievers in, in you know, the workplace or even their neighbors or whatever. But here's the thing you have to understand, folks. You're there to work. You're there to work. You're being paid to work. You're not there to hang out. You are not there to preach. You're there to work. That's what you're there for. You know, get in church and go soul winning. Get in church and go soul winning. Look, imagine if you had a Christian boss who was saved. And look, I know many believers, Bible-believing, saved Christian men who own businesses. And some of them have employed people that are all saved, and that's great. But some of them have employees that are not all saved. And if you had a Christian boss who was saved, just like you, and then you went to work and all you were doing is going around and just, just soul winning and trying to just get in debates and just, just you know, reason with people over and over all day long about you know, getting people saved and getting them. Like, I, I mean, your heart's in the right place. I get it. But you're going to upset even your Christian boss at that point. Because we're there to work. We're there to work. And look, here's the thing. If you are friendly and people like you, and especially if you become, you know, look, become a master of your trade. I can't stress that enough. Become a master of your trade. Become the top 10% of whatever you do. Just, just make that a goal in your life. Just be like, I, I, whatever this skill is, this trade is, I'm going to be top 10%. And look, I'm telling you, you won't have any problems. And you will have much more leeway. You'll have much more respect. And you know what? You'll have people coming to you and wanting to commune with you oftener. Because they'll be like, that, that guy's just killing it at everything he does. I want to know what's going on with him. What must I do? They're going to start asking questions like that. And that's what will happen. All right? But look, people, if you do become a master of your trade and you become very skillfully, become that top 10%, People will want to hear what you have to say on things. I'm like this with just unsaved people that are just super skillful in one area. I just like, I could sit in a room like that and I could listen to people that are the top of their game in whatever that industry is. I could listen to those people for hours. Because I, I want to know how they became so masterful. The Christian will stand out quickly in the workplace. And here's the thing you have to understand. If people aren't asking you questions, they don't want to know. Even, look, even if people do. Look, there was a guy, when I first moved to California, I was a, I was a consultant, a contractor. I was just a, a private contractor doing consulting work. And there was this other private contractor that worked at the same company. This was a big engineering firm. And you want to talk about a situation where when you're a private contractor, I mean, you better be working every single minute of every single day, and every single minute better be billable, or they're, they're going to just fire you. And this other contractor, and I li look, I liked him very much, but he would come in my, he wasn't saying, I like him, I liked him. He would come in my office, and he liked me, and he would come in my office, and he would just, like, spew all his worldview on top of me. Just constantly, just like, what do you think about this and this and this? And here's the thing you have to understand about people at work that's different from the door. When Jesus says, shake the dust off your feet, look, the people at the door that we knock on their door, they can, they can shut the door. There's an out for them. If they're not interested, we'll ne we're probably never going to see that person again. But the people at work, I can't get away from them and they can't get away from me. This guy would come and just spew his secular visions on me. Like, and, and I just, there's, I, I, I listened to him for months. But, I, I mean, I couldn't get away. I mean, I would try to get the conversations back to the jobs as, as quickly as I possibly could, but I would always say to him, hey, I'll tell you my opinion on that someday. Before you leave here, I knew he was leaving in a couple months, I said, before you leave here, I'll tell you what I think about all this stuff. 
but then I would try to just steer him back to actually getting something designed. You know, but it just like, and, and like, he didn't have any opinions that were like mine, but I liked him. I liked him. He was a very good engineer. There was, I, look, I found things I could respect about him while I worked with him, if that makes sense. I didn't engage in any sin. There was never any, and look, he wasn't really a, in, engaged in bad stuff. So, I mean, it was easy for me to like him. He just had a lot of wacky, secular ideas, you know? So, but I listened to him for months. I couldn't get away from him. And then his last day, I took him out to lunch and I gave him the gospel. And guess what? He didn't get saved. And guess what? He even got a little offended. But guess what? Everything was fine. He was leaving. And like I didn't offend somebody that I worked with. You know? So you got to kind of have some sense about who you can use that fear with and you know, who you kind of just have to have compassion and just show yourself to be a testimony and let people kind of come to you. Let people commune with you oftener and let people ask you. And look, I've gotten several people that I work with saved, but they've always come to me and ask questions. And then I'm like, I'm just answering questions. Look, outside of work. You know, I bring them over after work or one guy at the downtown building, I uh, brought him into the church and gave him the gospel in the church and like, but it's outside of work. It's outside of the situation where I'm being paid to actually do a job. And I didn't have anybody cornered. You know, I didn't have anybody cornered. And so there's some things that you need to understand and balance there. All right. Look, my social life is my, my church family. My social life is my brothers and sisters in Christ. But it's okay to like the people that you work with and have them like you back. But it's, it's on that professional level that, hey, I'm always willing to help you. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be someone you can trust. And I'm going to be, you know, look, I'm going to be an obedient, uh, I'm going to be an obedient employee. Be an obedient employee, your boss is going to like you. You're like, oh, he's an obedient employee and he doesn't give any trouble and he's a good influence along the group. You think he's going to care that you're a Christian? He'll start to like the fact that you're a Christian. He'll start to be like, uh, even if he's not a Christian, he'll start to be like, uh, maybe I should find some more of these Baptists to work around here. I mean, that's how every Baptist should be. That's how every Baptist should be. You know, neighbors, I mean, neighbors are the same thing. I mean, neighbors are the same thing. I mean, I don't understand why, like, one thing that I've, I've started doing as of, like, 10 years ago is actually since I moved to Texas and California, it wasn't really a big deal in North Dakota because there was no neighbors. But I was going, like, before I buy a house somewhere, I always go talk to who the people are next door. And I always kind of say things like, hey, how's the neighborhood? But really, I'm asking, hey, who are you? Are you crazy? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out who these people are. You could have the nicest house, the nicest yard, everything could be perfect, and your neighbors could be nuts, and it would be miserable for you. So I don't understand why people don't put more emphasis on that personally. But look, we have very nice neighbors. We have, I, I don't even really like my neighborhood, but my neighbors are very nice. We've invited, I've invited them to church, and you know they have not come to church, but it's not like, hey, you know, I hate you. Why have you not come to church? You know, but look, here's another thing. I don't go to, you know, I don't, you know, we, we built a fence together, you know, uh, one of the neighbors and I, but I, we're not going to go hang out and be at the parties and all this. I don't know if there are, but I mean, the point is this, just there's that level of professionalism and friendliness and, and they like me and we like them. That's it. But there is a separation there. There is a separation there. And that's kind of the, you got to find, you got to have some wisdom about that too. You've got to have some wisdom about that, too. So here's the point I'm trying to make, just to wrap things up here tonight. Turn to Isaiah chapter 55. We aren't trying to be loved of the world at all costs as Christians. And look, folks, some people are not going to like who you are just because you're a Christian, just because you believe the Bible. But look, I'm thankful, I am very thankful that in America today, at least in Fresno today, I don't know, maybe some places are different. In Fresno today, it is not, that is not, the, va the vast majority of people are normal. The vast majority of people are just normal, unsaved people. We're not trying to be a friend of the world, but here's the thing, we are in the world. And the Bible does say you're going to be in the world. There will be a day, and there has been before, when just being a Christian will cause people to just bring persecution upon you. And that may happen here and there to even us today. 
But that's not the majority of people. Most people are not evil people. Sinners, yes. But, but so are we. Most people also, though, are not saved. And that's one thing. We have to, you know, Felix, he heard the gospel. He asked Paul about it. He heard it. And while he didn't accept it, it's super interesting and it's super, you know, it's super apl applicable to us that he still liked Paul. And he still wanted to commune with Paul. Which means that Paul wasn't coming over the top of Felix, being holier than thou, and just beating Felix down. And every time he had supper with Felix, just being like, you're going to burn in hell. Better enjoy those grapes. Because you're going to be on fire for eternity. I'm sure that's not the conversation that was happening. So he wanted to talk to him often. And guess what? If you look at Isaiah chapter 55, if you look at Isaiah chapter 55, and look at verse number 11, we don't know much about Felix or about the impact that Paul had on Felix, but look at verse number 11 where the Bible says, So shall my word that be that go forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Here's what I know. Here's what I know. The word of God and communing with Paul oftener had some impact on Felix's life or someone in Felix's life somewhere. That's what I know for sure. Because the word of God does not go forth void. You need to think about that soul winning today. Soul winning days. I, I said today like that was, a, that was a slip because we had a super unreceptive soul winning time today. But look, the word of God does not go out Void. We will never know the impact that our soul winning, that preaching the word of God has had until we get to heaven. You will never know. You know, you know the people that get saved. That we can see. You know the people that get saved and, and get to church and, and, and become disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. That we can see. But there's many times you go out soul winning where like nobody seems to want to listen, but the word of God does not go out and it will not return void. So some impact is being, you know, is being affected every single time, you know, the word of God is preached. You know, I mean, those are those seeds. You never know where those seeds go. You never know where that, who's going to pick up that invite and look at that video. The full impact we'll never know until we actually get to heaven. So we're going to be in the world. We're going to be in the world. And we should be, you know, we should have a good report of them that are without is kind of the point that we see, and we see that exercise through Paul with Felix here. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.